Well, thank you, guys. Thanks, Mehdi, for the invitation. Is there a clock? No, no I am your clock. No. Okay. <laughs> All right, so I have to apologize in advance. You know, the videos, they weren't able to get some of the videos to play, unfortunately. Um, but you'll see in this session a tibiopetal axis. I think if you're doing CLI intervention, you have to be good at tibiopetal axis. It has to be a part of the armamentarium. I think it's gained momentum in the last 10 years and has uh, really been accepted as sort of a standard that needs to be done for most patients with CLI. It's also been shown to be very uh, safe with low complication rates when done uh, uh, correctly. Uh, there, you can do it with fluoroscopic guidance, which is what I did in the beginning, but in the last six, seven years, it's been ultrasound almost exclusively, and I think this ultrasound can help uh, make the process safer for both you and your patients. So selecting the access point is uh, some, somewhat you know, logic, uh, common sense. It's angiosome directed ideally. Uh, so if you have an ulcer on the bottom of the foot, you're going to go after the posterior tibia. You're going to go where the posterior tibia probably reconstitutes and get that access. On a practical level, sometimes it's anatomy dictated. Uh, it depends on the site of occlusion, the quality of the access vessel. Um, you know, is it calcified? What's the size? Is it visualized okay under ultrasound? Is it tortuous? Uh, to make it feasible for access. So you kind of have to get what, you, what, you, what you're given. Uh, take what you're given. So for anterotibial or peroneal access, uh, typically the foot ideal situation would be in this sort of position. Uh, and you'll see I have peroneal sort of in two different spots. Uh, I like to access the anterotibial in this area if I can. Uh, if the occlusion site is right here, then we typically go in the dorsalis pedis. And again, if the, access, uh, if the occlusion is even more distal, we'll go down into the, the, uh, what we call a digital stick. It's really the dorsal metatarsal artery. Uh, you know, up here, if you can get it above the uh, anterior communicating artery, it's nice because as the, the sheath is in, a lot of times, even if it's not, um, you know, it's, the artery is big, there'll be spasm, you'll have occlusion, um, and you'll have flow through the anterior communicating artery sort of perfusing the distal bed. PT peroneal artery access, again, ideally, if the patient can frog their leg out, this makes it a lot better for you. Uh, in terms of getting access, and I like to get it above the ankle, somewhere, somewhere within four finger breasts above the ankle, where it's a little straighter, uh, a little deeper, uh, and, I'll, and I do it because I like long access. Uh, peroneal access, I have it here too, because again, peroneal access you can get from an anterior approach and a posterior approach. Typically by <coughs> ultrasound, I go posterior. Uh, it's the same thing as a posterior tibial, but it's just sort of uh, twice as deep. Uh, if I'm using uh, fluoroscopic, if I can't see it with ultrasound, I'll go anterolateral and come from the anterior approach. So the benefits of ultrasound is that there's no radiation, no contrast. You avoid the veins. So again, here's the typical appearance, artery, vein, vein. Sometimes the veins ride right over the artery. A lot of times I've seen up to five veins around an artery, so it can have anomalous veins. Real-time visualization. So it doesn't matter if the patient moves when you stick them. You, you can still visualize, unlike uh, fluoroscopic roadmap. You can watch the wire traverse the vessel, lesion, and there's higher first, uh, you know, attempt access. Uh, you know, in the old days when I used fluoroscopic exclusively, you know, you'd be under the thing, radiating yourself, you get blood, you put the wire in, you put the sheath in, and you're in the vein. So again, to, act, to minimize complications, good visualization is key. Have patience when you start this, okay? Have patience to get the best image. If you're using a tech, and I recommend use a tech in the beginning, uh, let them get the image, follow the tip down to the artery as opposed to sort of just guessing where you are. Um, so again, typically I use the smallest access. I keep it in the least amount of time. Now the least amount of time doesn't mean always get it out as soon as possible. I typically make sure that I cross the lesion, I deliver therapy, I balloon, and that's when I might get rid of the sheath. Uh, flush often, and I typically run my ACT over 250. Uh, we talked about over communicating arteries. Uh, if you have access from both directions, I like to image it after the sheath is removed. Uh, just to make sure that there's no hematoma or continued bleeding. And train your staff on hemostasis. So this is the unit we use in our lab. You can see the uh, hockey stick probe is really nice, smaller footprint, um, high frequency, so it, sh it images superficial structures very well. But if you do do something deeper, like groin access or, or perineal access, the um, multi-frequency uh, probe is better because it images better deep, uh, deeper tissues. So again, you want to set your image ideally. You don't want it too deep. You want it sort of optimized. You want the gain set appropriately. Thank you, three minutes. So again, this is a thin beam of sound, and you can see short axis versus long axis. In the short axis, it's very different because you want to focus your beam on the needle tip. So it's a little harder if you have two people doing it, though, tech and you. But if you close the angle between the needle and the probe, you have a little better chance of seeing the needle come down on the vessel. Uh, you get a little directionality. You can uh, adjust it, and you can follow the needle tip a little bit better. I like longitudinal. 
If you have a tech, the tech basically focuses their beam on the, on the artery. That's all they do. Keep the artery in focus. You come in and you adjust the needle, medial and lateral, until you see the tip advancing as you push. And if you follow that all the way down, you see the artery tent, you pop it in, you don't have to move the probe, wire goes in. One tip is when you get down under the skin, start bouncing the needle, your eye sees a moving object better than a static object. I see a lot of beginners have a really good position, but they, they stop. They think that they didn't get blood, they, they're not in. These vessels are typically calcified, you need to push down on them a lot. Um, and so commit if you see a good approach. Also, once you pop through, because you are pushing it down so far, a lot of times you're on the posterior wall, the, the wire meets uh, uh, resistance, so sometimes I tap, tap, tap as I'm pulling the wire, uh, needle back, and you'll see that release. On the right, that's actually a vein, so it's an exa exaggerated motion. A lot of times I don't give lidocaine. If it's a tough stick, once you give lidocaine, the image gets even worse. Uh, a lot of these patients are neuropathic, and they're still going to feel a needle stick if they do, so I, I actually get access first, and then I lidocaine. <clears throat> Here's an example of a calcified vessel. You can see it moving around. So again, ultrasound offers the option of real-time imaging. Uh, dorsal metatarsal access, same thing. Ultrasound, you can see the vessel here, the two calcified tracks, the needle coming in. And that's what it looks like. So here's medial plantar access, dorsal metatarsal access. Here's what the lateral, medial plantar looks like on ultrasound. So this one didn't play, but sometimes you have to be careful. You know, manual compression is what I do for the most part, um, but you want to take a picture and make sure there's no hematoma on the vessel or pseudoaneurysm by ultrasound. So this is a, this is a case that's not going to play. But you can access occluded arteries. So in this case, we actually accessed an occluded anterior tibial artery. You can see the top and the bottom. If it's a nice visualization like this, you can enter it, flip, you know, prolapse your wire, push it through, and it's helpful in some cases. Okay, so let's go through the case. Sorry, they weren't able to get it to play. All right, real quick on uh, fluoroscopic guidance, because sometimes you don't have an ultrasound tech, sometimes you don't have the skill set. So uh, this is just for reference, but bottom line is camera position is very similar to where your ultrasound beam would be. Here's an example of anterior tibial access. Here's posterior tibial access. Here's peroneal access. So again, anterolateral, you put your camera about 20 or 30 degrees ipsilateral. You come down, you separate the tibia and fibula, inject contrast and you come down through the interosseous membrane into the peroneal artery. Here's a, a, a live example. So you want to keep your needle parallel, you inject contrast, you push it down into the vessel. If you don't see blood, you can move the camera orthogonal. And then in this view, you can see that you've gone past it, come back, and pass your wire. Another example of the same thing. And uh, if you do do it this way, they do have a needle extension holder that helps with uh, reducing radiation. So again, one more case that unfortunately did not play, but I think time-wise we're... So Art, thing. let me ask you a question, yeah. you, know, it, you know, for the sake of time, you know, you're showing these fantastic, you know, access points, you know, metatarsal, you know, digital, you know, ATP. How many of these, you know, so give us a brief in 30 seconds. Where do you, if you haven't done many of these, where should you start? And how many do you need to do to feel good about it? Yeah. Uh, you know, what's the learning curve? So I would say if you um, are just starting, um, I think it's important to get uh, you know, <clears throat> adept at ultrasound. So use your ultrasound for every groin access, even just regular retrograde for, uh, femoral. Um, use it in critical limb ischemia patients because, again, you don't want to damage claudicants and, and stuff like that. Uh, you don't want to be you know, blamed for, for uh, um, borderline indications. Uh, but use it in patients that may have you know, at least two vessel runoff. Uh, maybe decent distal runoff, but have, you know, popliteal uh, SFA occlusions. I think those are the ones that are good to start off with because they're, you know, sort of wide open. Uh, and I would say, you know, 25 to 50, yeah. get, to get comfortable with it. Uh, and then as it, you know, as the cases get more and more difficult, I think um, you progress there. Right. I think, thank you so much. Yeah. No. Thank the, you, guys. Awesome.